Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're going against the spread on this first week of the NBA basketball playoffs. Major League Baseball now close to a month under their belt. And joining us on the show, as we always do here on Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, our panel of experts, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, the legend himself, Jim Feist from Jim Feist Sports, and our good friend, Tony Mejia, playbook experts and contributor to the sporting news, not to mention our co-host and our producer, I should say, Greg De Palma. And we're all set, guys, to go against the spread on this card. Now, let's start off first, if we may, with the Major League Baseball scene. I'll be upfront and honest with everybody here. I'm not handicapping baseball right now until May gets here. That's sort of my MO. I like to get these teams have pitchers have some starts behind their belt because that's what I handicap first and foremost is 90% of what I do is pitching. But uh, I'm going to throw it out to you, Andy, and uh, let me know your thoughts on what's happened so far in the Major League Baseball scene and what you're expecting coming up here sooner than later. Well, certainly, Mark. Uh, I do get involved in baseball from the start of the season. I don't get involved with futures as much as I have in the past, and that's because there are so many more opportunities on a daily basis with uh, player props for those who are involved with that, first five inning sides and totals, etc., in-game wagering, that uh, it doesn't make sense to tie up a, a decent part of the bank, or even any part of the bank, or even a minimal part, for such a long period of time when you could be churning it over and over and over during the season. I will make some future plays as the season develops, so I don't tie it up from the start of the season, but I'll wait anywhere from oh, 45 to 90 days, in the middle of May to maybe the uh, end of June, uh, before really starting to see how these things turn out, because we see so many teams over the years who get off the quick starts and fade or get off the slow starts and pick up steam. And then there are some teams that get off the quick starts that are surprising and continue to play that well. For example, Baltimore last year and then other teams that get off the slow starts and they never seem to recover. For example, let's see how the Houston Astros develop this year. They're off to a, ter a terrible start. They've had some injuries. They've had some more injuries right now. We don't know. I guess the, we're on the verge of seeing Justin Verlander uh, finally make his start. Framba Valdez, who was the outstanding lefty for them last year, uh, he's on the shelf for a little bit. We've had a couple of season-ending injuries in Major League Baseball uh, to uh, uh, teams that certainly were considered contenders. Uh, Steven Strider of, uh, uh, of Atlanta, uh, he's out for the season. Shane Bieber, who was off to a great start for Cleveland, he's out for the season. What I've been doing over the first part of the season is I've been looking at some of the teams that seem to have upgraded themselves during the off season, but of which I wasn't sure were going to translate then into immediate improvement. But teams like Pittsburgh are off to a good start. The team that I've ridden a lot lately, Kansas City, has been off to a very good start. And those are teams that I will continue to follow. Now, there is one thing that I did some research in the off season to get more involved with the first five inning options, which is basically like playing the first half of an NFL game or the first half of an NBA game. Of course, in the NBA, you can play by quarters as well. And I like to take the bullpen out as much as possible. So I went through and did a study last year of all the pitchers who made starts. There are 2,430 regular season games. Of those 2,430, that means there are 4,860 starts considering both teams in the game. 70% of the starts last year, and I was surprised that the number was this high, were pitchers who went five innings or more. So I look to concentrate on backing pitchers that will that are likely or have shown the ability more, much more often than not to go at least five innings to take the bullpen out of some of the late game things that we've been seeing more and more of in recent years, and especially things with uh, that uh, ghost runner at second should the game go into extra innings. So I will often look to play first inning sides uh, when I've got a nice mismatch in pitchers, but both of whom, well, certainly the good pitcher, I expect to go the five innings. The bad pitcher, I expect not to last the five innings. If I find two pitchers who might not last the five innings, then I might look for uh, the first five innings to go over rather than wait for the bullpen to come in and do their job. And the same thing is for uh, teams where I like low-scoring games with quality starting pitchers. That's when I used to really start getting involved with the first five innings, playing those games under, knowing that if both pitchers pitch the way that they've shown, and normally they'll go through the lineup in five innings, 
maybe slightly, if they're effective, slightly into the third, uh, um, maybe slightly into the third time through the batting order. They may face, um, oh, 22, 23 hitters if they're if they're on their games, each, each pitcher or either pitcher. So I'll do that. I still like to play full game situations in a number of matchups, especially when I've got a lopsided favorite that I think will win the game even with the bullpen. It's even better if they have one of my better rated bullpens and I'll lay the run and a half to get the plus price and reduce the uh, the amount risk. As I tell people in playing run lines, especially with the favorite, there's only one result that hurts you when you bet a favorite on the run line and that's when they win by exactly one run because you don't collect. If they win by uh, uh, two or more, you collect a nice price. And if they lose outright, you lose, let's say, a single unit. If, let's say, the plus, the minus one and a half is a plus price, you lose only one unit versus losing a unit or more. In fact, let's go back to the game earlier this week. Uh, I think it was on Monday when, Was- when uh, Washington was at the Dodgers, and the Dodgers were like minus 450. Even if you played them on a run line, you were laying a huge amount. But let's say you just played them straight, okay? They lost that game. So you lost four, uh, 4.75 units if you just laid them straight. You lost a little bit, about maybe half a little under half of that if you played them on the run line, which means that it takes an awful lot of just normal winners to recoup what you've lost. Now, there are people who will say, well, yeah, well, why not parlay the, uh, uh, the big favorite or even the big minus one and a half? Well, if you do the math, Laying 475, let's say you have a two-team parlay that you like and you add the 475 in as a third team, the added amount that you win is minimal compared to, uh, uh, well, certainly compared to if you lose it outright. So uh, those are some of the strategies that I've employed. But uh, to sum up what I've done in the offseason and what I started to do this season, rely much more on first inning plays, first five inning plays. Andy Isco's approach to Major League Baseball, he's in it right from the get-go. And uh, Jim Feist, I, I know this, that uh, you do not like to get into the NBA regular season portion of basketball, the NBA, and I think it's largely because these players you feel aren't giving 100% in every game they're playing. Uh, would that hold true for you in Major League Baseball throughout the course of a regular season? No. Uh, I, You know the lineups before they before they go on the field, and, and uh, you, can, you can adjust your batting at that point if there's any major changes in the lineup. Like baseball, I, I, I have uh, a lot more confidence in the players showing up and playing that I do in, in the NBA. The NBA is um, it's it's Russian roulette times ten when you <laughs> when you <laughs> when you uh, you're putting hard on money down on on teams and they don't show up with their players. Now when they get to the this is why I like and do very well in the playoffs because then I really do start. Now we've only had a couple of games so far in the play-in round, but I lost the first one with the Warriors. I won the the second with the with the Heat. Uh, plus the points last night, but that'll continue. And then as, as they start to play, you'll see who's playing, who's not playing. But you're going to see the full complement of players if they're healthy, going out there and doing the best they can for the full time. And and that's where I get to come because they're unbelievable players. That they're super talented, and for some reason they feel like they have to rest during the year. Of course, going back in time, we all remember the guys that played every game and never took any time off, but that's no more. But well, you know why they do that, Jim, why they rest? Uh, they're because not, they can't. They're, because they're, they not, can't. They're, they're not paid enough. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interject there, but it's a sore point with me as well. <laughs> uh, I know. it's Us old timers, I mean, we see the guy gets paid $40 million, he has to take time off. I mean, I, give me a break. Unbelievable. Um, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this other question before I turn this over to Tony here, Jim. Uh, Andy hit on a subject that uh, I think is uh, really relevant in Major League Baseball today. And as I mentioned before, a lot of what I do, 90% of what I do is based on pitchers. And people ask me why. And basically it's because that's how the games are priced, with the pitchers, uh, entirely with the pitchers. But what we're seeing more and more here, and what I'm noticing here, is these ace pitchers, going on the DL and out for the season, early in the season like it is right now. Uh, Tommy John surgery, elbows, whatever it happens to be, we're seeing them fall at an unbelievable pace here right now. Andy mentioned Shane Bieber, Strider, uh, and we're seeing more and more of these. And my contention is the reason we're seeing them is because pitching today is all about the fastball, 
the velocity of the fastball. Uh, uh, there was a pitcher that said uh, that's what we're being paid for is to see how who can throw the hardest. I got a feel that that's really, really killing Major League Baseball right now. Uh, what's your take on that? Because, like you said, you and I go back to the days when we would watch Wilbur Wood pitch a double hitter, both sides of a double hitter, and today these starters do well if they make six innings. Is that was that for me? You're talking. Yes, about? yes, yes. Well, the, you know, the the fastball is. You don't have to do a lot with your hand to throw a fastball, a little side action here or there, but maybe may move a little bit in one direction or another. But back in the, the days when they threw a lot of junk pitch, pitches and the and and the, the pitchers had to do a lot, a lot of manipulation with their arm, and like Koufax, you go back to Koufax, he threw that overhand curveball that dropped like a like a rock. Fell off but, the table, right? Yeah, it fell right off the table. I mean, you don't see a lot of pitchers throwing that pitch because of, of the damage it does to your elbow. And the, the Tommy John's been around a long time. But, and the surprising thing about this is they have a pitch count now on pitchers. I mean, they've had this for a while, you know, but, but back in the day, they didn't. I mean, you'd see a guy go out there and, and, and pitch 11, 12 innings and never take them out. But you, you'll never see that now. They usually have five innings on it, and, and uh, they'll take them out at 99 pitches or whatever the number is. You think that that would be saving the pitcher's arms, which is the idea of it in the first first place. But it, the, like you said, they're dropping faster now than they have been in the past. Yeah, they're ripping it and letting it rip. That's what they're doing right now. Uh, Tony, what's your take on this subject that we're talking about, pitchers? Uh, as I said, they're the key, my key element when I handicap baseball. And, uh, you know, one of the things I like to do is uh, weigh pitchers' whips uh, and look for sure. deficiencies and things like that. Uh, what is Major League Baseball doing these days uh, with these pitchers here, limiting to five innings or six innings uh, pitch counts? And I also, I got one other question I want to know from you is do you feel that with the clock now in effect in Major League Baseball, where these pitchers have to get more pitches in in a shorter period of time? Is that also unsettling for the pitcher? It might be unsettling, but I don't buy it as being a reason why we have injuries uh, amped up the way they are. By the way, I, I have both Yuri Perez and Spencer Strider on my fantasy team, so I might be all screwed until next season. So that, that was a tough blow. But check this out. I think uh, it, it's entirely related to the fastball and some of these breaking pitches, these sweepers uh, that are fairly new to the equation and, and, and these pitchers you know go into the lab relatively quickly after the season and trying to Im improve for the next year uh, and they're on shorter contracts we we just saw you know a situation where Blake Snell couldn't get guaranteed money coming off a Cy Young award season uh, so all these guys are under pressure uh, and uh, you know there, there's also uh, you, you look at the pitch count that you, that you and Jim mentioned absolutely comes into play um, it's, it's very similar I think to, to NBA maintenance issues put these millions of dollars into these athletes you want them to be there when it matters most in the postseason uh and yet you have different situations that vary like a kid like Yuri Perez is 21 years old Strider already had uh, uh at Clemson uh Tommy John surgery so this will be his second one you know you go into this and sometimes you, your uh, elbow just gives out uh Sandy Alcantara is a throwback in terms of being a guy that wanted to be out there in the ninth inning uh, and, and won a Cy Young because of that and, and registered the most complete games that we've seen over the last decade. Uh, and now he's out with, 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 for Tommy John as well. So, and you've got Bieber, again, a, a veteran who didn't really break down until later in his career, comes back this season, looks fantastic, and then he's done after a couple of starts. So I, I really don't think that you can take it as a, a blanket statement in terms of what's going on with these pitchers. I think it does uh, go into an individual case-by-case -case basis, but certainly, uh, we are seeing a situation where these these arms are breaking down, and uh, I think you hit it on the head in terms of speed. It's it's guys throwing as hard as they can, as often as they can, not really pacing themselves, and uh, ultimately it, it costing them in in missing seasons. You know, you know, Mark, I was I was going to yeah. mention that just just for a moment, the different structure in baseball wagering in recent years, which has become more prevalent. You used to always be able to list starters. Now there are a number of sports books that don't allow you to list starters. 
and you have action regardless of who starts. And they, you know, what it used to be is uh, if you bet the action, they would adjust the price if there was a pitching change. Now you get the price at which you, if you're playing action now, the, uh, the price stays the same because it's irre- it's, it doesn't concern who starts anymore. They make the price based upon the expected pitcher, but then they will make changes, but you get whatever price is listed on your ticket. And that sort of leads me to one of the questions, and maybe Tony is focused on it or one of the other guys. The purpose of having the uh, one inning starter, you know, the the guy who comes in, pitches the first inning, I've never understood the purpose of that because basically, now we don't see it with the the extra inning rules now that you could have a lengthy game. You're basically wasting a pitcher who you might need later in the contest. I've always thought if you wanted to do something, and I think Tony La Russa may have done this back in the early 1990s, I think with Oakland, but if you want to do something sort of like that so that you don't give hitters additional time to figure out what you're doing, why don't you have uh, pitchers designed for each day to go one time through the order, and then when the uh, leadoff hitter comes up for the second time, that's when you make your move if your pitcher has been relatively effective and you know didn't get pulled after three outs. It seems like that would be a better way of perhaps um, – making it more difficult on the batters to get accustomed to your motion if they only see them once, perhaps twice at most. And also it might uh, uh, allow pitchers to have a little bit more activity and not have to throw as many pitchers as hard if they're only going, uh, you know, 8, 10 batters, whatever it is, instead of maybe, you know, 18, 20, 25. Hey, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the one-inning pitchers was basically set up to become a bullpen game uh, because whoever followed that one-inning pitcher was largely – from the bullpens and uh, they were re- basically resting starters uh, that was their charting course of their plan was to rest starters and let the bullpens take over the games uh, what's your take on one inning pitchers or bullpen pitchers as far as starting pitching goes in baseball well I don't think the fans like it but uh, I believe it started uh, with the Rays I'm pretty sure they were the first team that Joe adop- yeah that adopted that and uh you know, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I think it was more of the fact that uh, he didn't have five quality starting pitchers. So this was the best way of winning a football game. It was like people, you know, it's, it's analytics. It's really what it is. It, it's, a, it's a form of analytics. And um, getting back to the Tommy John thing, because I did read it off of the uh, uh, your coffee uh, cup coffee club, uh, right. club uh, that everybody needs to make sure that they subscribe to. Um and I and then I did some additional reading and, and, and noticed that they've said that thirty five percent of major league baseball pitchers today, right now, have undergone Tommy John surgery. That's almost half. Thirty five percent. That's huge. So uh, see, whenever it happens to me as a fan by now, because I've been living it long enough, and, and keep this in remember I'm a Washington National fan, so I'm a Steven Strasburg fan. So I've been through this. So um, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, you know it's coming. Okay, you know, it's almost like you just, like, for instance, they got this guy, Susanna. Uh, they, I think they got him in the deal with the Padres for Soto. And this guy throws, like, 100 miles an hour, 105. And it's like, well, look, he's 19. You know he's going to go out. He's going to hit Tommy John at some point. So just be ready for it. And I'm sure the Nationals are going to be ready for it. And the, and the thing is, it's not going to change. There's no remedy out there. It's, it's you know the the people baseball they know they know what's going to happen, and all, all that's going to happen is is that more and more guys are going to keep throwing hard, and the more guys that throw hard, it's like a numbers game. Okay, you're on Tommy John, he's on Tommy John. That's okay. I'm going back down to the minors. I'm getting two other guys that throw 95 to 100 miles an hour. I'll put their arms. Uh, t- I'll kill them for this season. And when they go on uh, Tommy John next year, I got two more guys that are coming. So it's just it's it's not going to get fixed. So basically, basically what you're saying is if if you go back to the, the when they start playing baseball, you know, Little League, et cetera, et cetera, maybe the damage starts there. These are very underdeveloped children. Uh, they, they see who their stars are and they sure. see what the stars are throwing yep. the ball 100 miles an hour. So they're trying to do it, too. You're not yep. going to hold them back. Like two-year-old so they're, racehorses. They're exactly. doing the damage to their arms when they're very, very young. So by the time they get to the major leagues, their arms are already – a little bit broken and in order to keep their job they got to keep throwing hard and then they end up in the on, under the knife would a proposition jim interest you if they posted a prop like uh, how many starts will it be before pitcher xyz goes in for tommy john surgery 
<laughs> well, <laughs> it may be coming sooner than later. I don't think they'll do that, obviously. But uh, speaking of a, gambling, Mark, uh, yes. w w what's your opinion on the uh, Otani's former interpreter bookmaker scandal? Do you have a uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, any of you guys have any thoughts on on, on that? I, I have I have a thought with no no evidence whatsoever. If I'm Major League Baseball, the last person I want barred from baseball is <laughs> Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. Oh. That's, and that's why they're sweeping it under the rug it's what, and why they will. They'll fi end up finding this interpreter money, but you're not going to see Otani uh, missing many games because of this. Now, was he a gambler? That we don't know. I know that the Japanese people love to gamble, and he had money. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But as Jim mentions here, he's the marquee player in Major League Baseball around the world they can't afford to have him uh obviously you know be caught for gambling on baseball games uh, like that so did he do it i don't know would i be surprised no i wouldn't be surprised but uh, i still think it's going to continue to remain swept under the road well let's see how much uh, what the penalty is for the interpreter if he has to serve time then there might be a lot more to it if he gets hit with a hefty fine Otani will pay it and uh, may have different implications as far as what actually happened. Considering it's a, a it, it's right now looking at, at like a theft, he's going to serve time. I mean, he's already in federal custody. So uh, I would have thought if this is something that's being swept under the rug, he would have already chirped by now. I mean, there's no amount of money that is going to be okay for. Hey, I, all right, I'll 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 uh, I'll be your scapegoat and I'll do five years. No, thank you. Um, you know, from from that standpoint, I do believe there's more to to the story in terms of Otani probably getting down on some wagers, especially since they didn't bet on baseball at all. I mean, that's something that you're kind of covering your bases there. Like, all right, we love the we love the thrill of the gamble. Uh, we know if you're betting on your own sport, that's a whole different animal. Uh, the fact that there are you know the feds have come out and said in that report now no bets on baseball whatsoever uh, that is a little bit of uh, an inkling that maybe Otani's involved. Uh, but at, at the same time, like I, I have a hard time believing that this guy's going to do hard time for him. Uh, what what know. was the relationship between Otani and his interpreter? Was there a friendship or They're something? Their best friend. That, that, okay, so predated it. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's kind of <laughs> Yeah, they, they to, didn't uh, just meet in... in, yeah. in he wasn't just a scientist. To his, oh, by yeah, the he, way, Otani, he's he your interpreter. Here, but he had already, they had a pre-existing relationship yeah. Uh, based on him going back to Japan, but the guy was, the guy had all, all I think he, he did some work with the, with the Red Sox and the Yankees, and then went to Japan when Otani was really young, like a teenage young, but obviously he knew who he was going to be, uh, and befriended him there. And then Otani, well, once he, he, you know, came over, said, "Ah, oh, this is the guy I want, I want in my corner." So. Is what it is. By the way, speaking of, uh, of baseball scandals, um, I want to ask you guys opinions. Uh, who do you, who who do you who do you believe is the all-time single-season home run record leader winner? It's Barry Bonds to me. I mean, uh, obviously, obviously, anybody could say it's Hank Aaron, and it, that, that's fine with me as well. Uh, but I mean, just he, he well, did it in, in, in a single season. Everybody single was season. doing it. And what's that? Oh, you mean well, McGuire? Well, I mean Bonds would still have it for the single season, but I'm saying because I know you were saying Hank Aaron because you know, but I was just talking single season. Who oh, else? single so season who do you is yeah, do you, So I'm assuming you're still going with Bonds, of course. Then. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, everybody was juicing that what he was able to do in in the uh, in that era is still remarkable because. I mean, you still have to have a hand-eye coordination to, to pull that off. And the thing you know, to keep in mind, obviously, I'm, I'm, is I'm he not going to say it, that. I'm not going to say that he wasn't doing it illegally. Also I'm going to say I, I'm not going to get involved in the in the you know black and white of it. It's I mean in, in the in the I'm not, I'm just going to stick to the black and white. <laughs> of it. He, he did what he did, you know. Mark. Well, Andy, Andy brings out a good point that pitchers were also juiced, uh, so it was juice juice against juice. Uh, as it turns out, but uh, let me turn this around and ask you guys if this was back in an era before all this occurred here uh, in the 2000s and let's just say it was the uh, 40s and 50s uh, would people like uh, Mickey Mantle uh, 
if would they have do you think they would have had the opportunity to juice if they could have juiced if major league baseball was not going to penalize them wasn't greenies a big deal back then like everybody might have been yes was on amphetamines. Be. right eh. but but did the those amphetamines did they you know did it really bulk them up no it was well i mean it, it improves i guess your 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 concentration especially at, I, I mean look I, I look at it at, from from all the all the things that i've read everybody partied back then to a point where like half half of the league was a bunch of drunks and then the, the guys that could really stomach doing things the next day were marbles uh you know your Babe Bruce your Ty Cobbs and, and whatnot so yeah you know, I, I, I'd be, I'd I, think, be... I think there's something to every story in every era it'd be interesting to find out what kind of a uh uh mixture of uh steroids and uh alcoholic a, a extreme amount of alcoholic consumption uh what kind of a mix that would be what kind of a cocktail that would be so i know mickey mantle uh you know he it's too bad i mean if he didn't break down um it, he, he could have easily won the record but i just bring it up because judge if you're somebody that's against it all then I guess you're saying Aaron Judge, unless unless people believe Aaron Judge has been on any sort of steroids, but Judge would probably be the guy if you're against McGuire, Bonds, and Sosa. Probably so. Probably so. And by uh, the way, there was a really good movie on that, and I, and I recommended it uh, to Jim. I know Jim hasn't seen it yet. Uh, but uh, have you guys seen 61? Yeah. The uh, Maris Mantle uh, race. Yeah. When Mantle got... Man, it was it, the fans were rooting for Mantle because he was a longtime hero, and then he got injured. I think uh, what about three weeks before the end of the season, so he got stuck at sixty at uh, fifty four. He might have been the uh, record holder for the thirty uh, something years. Yeah, and he's the only one besides me that have seen sixty one. You guys got to see sixty one. <laughs> I have not. No. Yes, no, you're right. I got. I got. I, I may have. I don't really. Where where is, where that's the uh, that's the movie put together by uh, Billy Crystal. Yes, it was an HBO uh, movie. Yep. I probably have one. Hey, guys, let's wrap up the baseball thing here. Andy uh, elaborated to us and laid out nicely about his approach to Major League Baseball. I want to check with uh, Jim and Tony on their approaches as well. Jim, what is it you're primarily looking for when it comes to handicapping Major League Baseball? Value, uh, form, streaks, pitchers? You know, what is it that catches your eye first and foremost? <laughs> All of the above. but the, uh, <laughs> Check the boxes, huh? <laughs> the, the, um, the, the reality is... It, it always starts with value. I mean, I'm never going to lay 440 on a, on a team to win. I'm, that, I'm, I'm never going to do that. Matter of fact, I have trouble playing over 160, which is eight to five in, in East Coast uh, parlance. Yes, it is. right. Uh, but but you know, and then then when they put in the first five, which didn't always exist, you couldn't always bet first fives. But they get the totals. You get the you can bet strikeouts. You can bet over and under on strikeouts, over and under on you know a lot of different things. There's a lot of options in betting baseball today than we had many years ago that just weren't available. But what I look for, I start with the pitchers because what you said, Mark, that's where the price is made. However, it's modified. Now, I'm going to give you an example today. Texas is starting a kid named Jack Leiter, I believe his name is. Now, this kid's coming out of, this is his first start. He's just brought up from the minors, and they say he's phenomenal at the minor league level. Now, the price on the game, considering they're on the road, really they're favored because the price on the game is even. So you're really you're taking away the home field advantage, and you're favoring this kid who's never pitched at this level. Um, I think he's going against um, Maeda or something like that today, but. They're favoring him. Now, granted, I don't think they're going to let him go any more than four or five innings. So now you're going to go into the bullpen. I don't think you're going to let this kid go beyond four or five. So this comes down to the complicated factor when you have in baseball. So if you're going to bet him, I would probably bet him for the first five. Because I don't think we're going to see him after that. And who, who the heck knows how he's going to do, A, in the first five, or if he went beyond that. Would they even let him in, or and how would he do if he held up against major league hitting beyond five innings? Because you're now going through the second and third time through the lineup, which is always much more difficult. 
Well, he, so, the game is already underway. And yeah, I'm, I'm watching it on my big screen. Yeah, I don't know if you guys he, caught my reaction earlier, but it was related to he gets a fly ball, two outs, up 7-4, and Leody Tavares just basically butchered it. Uh, just a, a major league outfielder drops a fly ball. Three and, and now two it's thirds seven innings. And he's out after three and two thirds. Yeah, so eight, eight oh, hits, seven runs, all earned. Uh, not ready for the same point. Yeah. The thing runs? that's a little concerning is three strikeouts and three walks. It would have yeah, been a little I mean, bit better if he had, uh, okay, maybe one walk and six strikeouts in addition to all the damage that was done off the bat. I mean, this, this kid was the number two overall pick. He pitched at Vanderbilt. He's Al Leiter's son, Mark Leiter's nephew. Uh, so he's a legacy and uh, kind of shaky in, early on in, in the minors, um, but kind of has put it together. So I, I think we'll see him all season. I don't think this is uh, something where he's just up for a, a spot start. But, um, you know, got got – Got a four nothing lead, gave that up, and it wasn't his fault that he gave up a seven to four lead. But he's out of the game now, and yeah, it's a it's a bullpen game. I, I'm on Texas. I just think Jim, uh, from this from this standpoint, and I'll 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 take this to my approach in the in the baseball. I look at it day to day. I make my own line, so this is basically what my sheet looks like, and it's it, I'll, I'll try to bring it up to the closer to the thing. But it's it's basically every starter, and these are my lines, and I'll go to day to day on it. And my take on this is Kenta Maeda has uh, pitched against really bad offenses, and he's hasn't won yet. Um, I think he, he pitched against the A's and the uh, White Sox, both terrible. This is the best offense he's seen. Rangers are, you know, top five offense anyway. You slice it lineup wise and the way they approach a game. Uh, and and so technically, I was right. Uh, Rangers tore him apart, but uh, you know, bad fielding and and uh, Leiter not being there, you know, turns in this into a toss up. Um, but yeah, that's baseball. I think Tony, do uh, you uh, do you, so when you do that and you do all that prep? Do you do the prep and then take a look at the line after that? After you've made your own? Yeah, line? I'll look at the line just to make sure it's not off significantly. But I mean, it, it's pretty much going to be in the in the in the ballpark. Um, and uh, I like what I look. I do I do my prep, so I I have it, and then I I want to make sure that everybody that I I anticipate being in the lineup is in the lineup. Sometimes, you know, you got your getaway days on Sundays or Wednesdays and you know, day game after a night game where you, you project somebody to be in the mix and that changes the whole lineup and skews things. Uh, you know, guys being in places that they're not supposed to be or guys being out. Um, but, you know, you, you can pretty much readily get stats of, uh, you know, batter versus pitcher histories, I think, oh, yeah. play a huge role in, in, in what I do because – Technically, if a, if a hitter sees you really well, they're going to continue to see you really well. Um, Jordan Alvarez, I mean, he has stats against a bunch of guys that he just continuously abuses. And there, there's there's probably, what, like two guys per lineup that you have to count on to be the, the bulk guy and the rest is a crapshoot. You know, do you play, uh, Tony, do you play beat the streak? No, no, I do not. You know what that's what all that? about? To win the uh, $5.6 million from Major League Baseball, you – pick a batter and if he uh, gets a hit that day uh you uh, uh your streak continues in fact they i don't think oh, really? i think they've had it like 10 years and i don't think they've given away the 5.6 million you know, to match your streak 5.6 you have to do it 56 straight days no actually they i think they want to try and give it away so now you can pick up to two hitters a day to get a hit but both have to get hit and your streak increases by two instead of the one with one batter it's on the, the MLB website, MLB app, stuff like that. It's kind of fun. And, but, that, but the reason I bring it up is that's exactly what you want to look for is the pitcher-hitter matchup. Not just, a, you know, a guy may be hitting 328 on the season, but today he's facing a guy who he's hitting like uh, you know, 127 against in, say, 37 at-bats or something. So whereas on the surface it might look like, oh, here's a guy who's you know, tearing it up. But when you do the deep, uh, you know, the deeper dive, you find out that this is a pitcher against whom he struggled, and he may see him three times during that game. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I take a look at that, and I, I, I'm big on totals as well. So if I'm betting an over, it's always going to be a full game. If I'm betting an under, it's 90% of the time going to be a first five. I want to take the bullpens out of the equation as often as possible. Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, just because of the ghost runner at this point. I think the other day was uh, Boston and Cleveland. Uh, it might have been a 2-2 game in like the seventh. It ends up 7-6. I mean, because you, you go one inning after another, after another, after another. And, uh, you know, Tampa and, and the Angels did that the other day as well. I mean, you're just watching it, uh, and it, it becomes a coin flip. But Dave Koken, who I know you guys all know, uh, he 
you say, all right, we're going into the coin flip portion of MLB. Uh, and, and that's really what it is. You got a guy on second. You know, can the reliever get that first out uh, without the runner advancing? If he doesn't, he's pretty much going to give up the run. So, yeah, by, um, by the way, but, Tony, you mentioned before about complete games. You know, here we are. We're not even, uh, we're barely half a month into the season. We've already had three complete games, two of which were in the past two or three days. I think we had, of course, the Blanco no hitter a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago. And then we had Sanchez of uh, Philadelphia go complete against uh, Colorado the other night and uh, Tanner Houck last night in their uh, 2 nothing win over Cleveland. So, uh, I mean, I like that. That's more like traditional baseball where yeah. the guys are able to go and, you know, pitch deep into the games. And we've seen a gradual reduction of the, the average length of starts going yeah. back probably about uh, 20 years or so. And then it affects handicapping because in the past, uh, you know, pitching, starting pitching, I think they may have said was like 70 to 75 percent. Now it's barely 50 percent, if that. I was surprised, Andy, at one stat you said earlier. You said that all the research you did that 70 percent of the starters went beyond five? No, five or more. And, and in other words, the result went six and seven. And that percent, in fact, the number of pitches, number of starts that involved going seven innings was about 12 percent. It was about 30 percent when you when you reduce it to six innings or more, and you went to five innings or more. It's 70 percent of all starts, and that's really what I'm interested in when it comes to the first five innings. If I've got two guys who, uh, and that's one thing that I'm starting to to chart this year, is the percentage of a pitcher starts that go five innings, and also wasted starts, where if a pitcher goes five innings or more and uh, gives up say two earned runs or less and ends up losing the game. That tells me it's an ineffective bullpen or the offense uh, didn't uh, uh, didn't come through. And that's why I like looking at pitchers who have losing records but have pitched very well for the purpose of using them in the first five, five innings. And they, actually, two of the ones, I just, one of them I just mentioned, Hauk, has been really good at going distances and limiting the opposition. The other, and he plays for Oakland, is uh, Blackburn. He's, uh, I think he finally gave up his first uh, runs of the season he's, yesterday. He's been amazing, actually. Yeah, and, and he's always going to be a pretty decent price because he's playing for a bad team. But, you know, if he's going to give them, the, he gives Oakland the best chance of winning by being able to go five innings. Yeah, they've won, I think, eight games, and he's pitched in four of them. So. Yeah. Andy mentioned five innings or more. I think that's the key number. And, obviously, I think the pitchers are also – keying in on five innings because that's where they get paid. They get wins only for five inning starts. Nothing less doesn't benefit them as far as contracts go when they renegotiate a contract. Uh, and one thing here, Tony, you mentioned uh, Dave Koken. And uh, Dave and I started out in the business right about the same time. And I know he's a near dear friend of Jim Feist. And Jim, I got to ask you, have you visited with Dave lately and how is he doing? Um, well, I'm not a doctor, but I know, I know he's, he's not He's 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 getting by. He needs some help. Um, he's he does have, you know, he has serious problems, and um, he is getting some help. Um, I don't I don't want to say too much because it's not none of right. to put it out there in the public. It's not your problem. That's it. He's you know he's aged and he's got a few ailments and like all of us we're gonna die from something and. Um, I, you know, I've talked to, I, I chat with Dave occasionally. I keep up, up with what he's doing. And I know he's uh, planning on moving to another part of town where he is going to get a little bit more help. So I, I think he's doing okay, but he has a serious ailment. Well, when you see him or talk to him, please give him our best and let him know that he's in our thoughts and uh, our prayers. Uh, he's a really, really, really good guy and a really an astute handicapper, as you well know, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Dave, Dave knows what he's doing. Yeah, Dave and uh, Jim worked a long, long time together uh, uh, when they did their television shows and everything together. So do that for me, if you will. Extend our best to him, if you will. Dave does have a nice presence on Facebook and uh, Twitter, so he's still very active in what he's been doing and sharing his thoughts. And uh, uh, now I think he's been a little spoiled with the Red Sox winning all those World Series championships this, uh, <laughs> this millennium. <laughs> Well, so would I be if I'm from that area. I would be the same way. I'm sure I would be. <laughs> hey, guys. We're still, uh, we're still waiting for Cleveland to do something. Yeah, sooner or later, Jim. Sooner or later. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up with uh, uh, we should ask everybody. I, uh, first of all, I want to ask, uh, does anybody right now have any World Series futures on your ledger? I do not. I, I do not. Okay. 
Uh, is there typically a time that you start normally investing in futures for baseball? The, the, you know, as far as future betting, the, you don't get really good odds betting futures. The bookmakers are shaved the numbers too much. And it's, it's you mean like for baseball? The, for for they, anything, they're just not they're not, just not good enough. I mean, if you're um, you're tying up your money like Andy mentioned earlier for a long period of time, you're not getting what what true odds are, um, and it's it's difficult to make those kind of bets. It's justifiably it's hard it's hard to justify that kind of outlay of cash, tying up money, not getting what should be true odds. Like if you're going to bet. If you're going to bought the Cleveland Guardians, is thirty plus thirty five hundred enough? I, I don't think so. So really, the only the only advice you would give then would be because I would look at it myself as, I mean, people play the stock market. Uh, they have investments. Uh, I got a six month investment. I got a one year investment. Well, to me, futures is. Well, I'm sure why they call it that as well, and that's what it is. Is look. I've got an investment. I got a six month baseball investment, whatever it is. And I feel so and so team is going to win the World Series, whether I'm getting five to one or 15 to one. But it has to be a significant number, doesn't it? Especially, I mean, look, every, every, it's all relative based on how much money everybody makes. But really, for the big guy, it has to be significant. It has to be where, something. Where they've, where they've changed in recent mm -hmm. years that I've noticed in, in basically all sports is at the expense of those middle tiered teams where you used to be able to get them say at 50 or 60 to one they're now down to the 25 to 30 to one range no value and exactly because what they'll do is the uh you know the what the um let's say the colorado rockies instead of being uh, you know 200 to one will be 500 to one because they've got or the white Sox would be something like that so they're making them at that end and at the same end they have a lot of short odds on uh, teams like the the dodgers uh, were they, they were like uh, five to two or something, and then they, I think they went down from that. So they don't make those valuable enough to play at that. And where you, where you lose it are the teams that figure to possibly be, oh, let's say wild card contenders, but who could make a run. And where you, you were getting, like I say, 50, 60 to one on those teams years ago, you're now getting, you know, 20, 25 to one or even less. And the other thing is you mentioned about the six month investment. And I talked about it at the start. With all the props that you have, the various ways that you can play, you know, you now have an, a 90-minute investment on a first five-inning game, and you can turn your your bankroll over or your part that you would allocate to futures over many more times than you can if you uh, uh, if you happen to uh, uh, have a you know a successful in-season in betting on a day on a daily basis. Uh, the, the difficult, the, I mean. The, the only future bet that I've made that I had any sort of confidence in was the year that uh, Brady signed with Tampa Bay. But I made the wager before the signing was announced because if you had followed Tampa Bay the previous season, their defense showed tremendous improvement over the second half of that season, and that was something that I liked. So I had a nice number on Tampa Bay. That number still wasn't adjusted as much as perhaps it could have been or should have been, but that was an example of a situation where I liked intrinsically the value of a team that nobody would like. For example, I didn't play it this year, but uh, the, I mentioned Pittsburgh and Kansas City as two teams that I were going that I was going to live for. Unfortunately, they're getting off the better starts than I hoped they would. I just wanted them to be playing like 500 ball for the first 60 games or so. They may exceed doing that, and uh, there'll still be some value in them because a, a lot of folks. Baltimore did not attract a lot of attention until what, maybe about two thirds of the season last year, when all of a sudden, hey, this is a good team, and they've been able to keep it up for 100 games. Well, just like hey, the guys. stock market, I would think that it would be one of those deals because you were saying, Andy, there's a lot you can you can actually make your money doing this. But what you're talking about is somebody that is a serious, I'm going to be wagering on baseball all season kind of approach, as as a as as aside from say a person that might be like, you know what. I'm looking for somebody. I'm looking for a stockbroker to help me invest money in the in this in uh, in Wall Street, the stock market. Hey, you know what? I'm looking for somebody to invest in futures for Major League Baseball. Let me ask Andy, Mark, Jim, Tony what they would do for futures because I'm not getting invested in this stuff on an everyday basis. But I want to enjoy the season. I want to play with a team that I can follow during the season, and I'm going to invest money on them, and I'm going to ask uh, their advice, and that's how I'm going to play it. That's probably and, and the best way to do it. 
And that's the and that's the way that it worked for many years. Because I would tell people, you know, uh, if you're just making one trip a year into Las Vegas and you and you're from Minnesota and you want to bet on the Twins, go go play. You got something to root <laughs> yeah. for. Now the difference with that this year now is that you've got legalized wagering all over the country, so people can do that almost anywhere in, in the thirty-something uh, states that uh, in which it's legal. But yeah, it, it's certainly something that I would, uh, uh, like if I were to say right now, a team that I would consider. I would say Kansas City might be worth a shot because I like their pitching staff. I like Reagan's. I like Singer's back in form. Uh, uh, Seth Lugo has uh, been pitching uh, wow. the way that he showed the potential to one. in the past. And they play in a division where there's no there's no Atlanta Braves. There's no uh, uh, there's no L.A. Dodgers in that division. There are some decent teams in there. Um, but arguably the, we- the weakest division in Major League Baseball. Top, when you talk yeah. top to bottom, yes. Not necessarily at the bottom. Well, no, I guess I have to say with the White Sox as bad as they are right now, it is at the bottom. But, yeah, I I would be surprised if the – in fact, this might be a nice prop for some books to put up and you know, maybe keep it up to the All-Star break. Which division winner will have the most wins or the fewest wins of the six divisions? Because I could see the American League Central producing uh, the uh, uh, the division with the fewest wins by the division champ, and I think we might see the NL Central close behind. All right, so I'm I'm uh, as we wrap up, I I'm I'm out there. I want to invest. I want a team. Andy, your recommendation to me is take Kansas City at eighty to one. Uh, what's the what's the well the what are the odds on Baltimore? Because I think that's still eleven to one. Low. Yeah, I I would go with Kansas City for a long shot. Okay, and but if I was willing to invest big money, you would say Baltimore at eleven to one, though. That's a more serious. I would say that's yeah. I would say that's a reasonable price. They still have some pitchers that haven't gotten back in the rotation yet. They have a tremendous lineup, and they have the confidence that comes from the great performance that they had uh, last year. And okay. again, we don't know what's going to happen with a team like Houston, which is off to a struggling start. How long will that last? Remember, this is a team, and I mentioned this. I think on one of the shows I did earlier in the week. Consider all the postseason experience that the Houston Astros have had since they became a winning team seven, eight years ago. The extra games that that team has played is probably the equivalent of at least three quarters, if not more, <laughs> of a full season. It takes a wear and tear on the pitcher's arms, on the batter's eyesight, etc., and all that uh, but to do that. And we see that in the NBA a lot, which is why, and I know Mark was going to talk about the fact that we don't have back-to-back champions. It's very difficult. What what Golden State has done, what Cleveland did for a while, was remarkable because they had success over a four- to five-year period, uh, but it, it, it sometimes comes to an end because all that wear and tear, especially in basketball, where the damage on your knees run up and down the court. You know, There's a big difference when you do it for 100 games if you make it to the NBA Finals versus 82 games in the regular season. Uh, Tony, uh, I'm... I'm, I'm... I'm asking you, uh, I've got some money. I want to put on a futures for baseball. What do you recommend? I do like the Royals, by the way. Uh, uh, Andy's spot on. Reagan's and Seth Lugo and Michael Walk is off to a great start, and they play in a weak division, and Pascantino's hitting the, uh, now that he's back. Bobby Wood Jr., uh, you know, he's, he's no flash in the pan. That guy's legit. Uh, so I do like that. Uh, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm not big on futures in MLB, not, not, not whatsoever. Uh, if you like the Dodgers, they're obviously going to be in that mix just because of their lineup and, and being so formidable. But they're they're having issues coming up with five starters, given all their injuries, Bueller and, and Kershaw. Uh, so I would say, and, and, I, and I would also say, you, there were probably a lot of people that had the Rangers as a gimmick pick last year uh, before before DeGrom went down. What were they, uh, and Texas? The, 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 yeah, the, the defending champion, Texas. No, I mean, what were they around the time, like around this time last year? You remember? Uh, I, I don't, although there, there was excitement that they had signed the Grom and they had a pretty good lineup. But now, I mean, now you've got the, the kid from Florida that they've got in the lineup. Uh, uh, Carter, who wasn't in the mix until late last year. So uh, they're not sneaking up on anybody this year. They're, what, 14 to 1. Uh, but they, they probably, I would I would wager to guess they were about plus 5,000 last year around this time. Oh, okay. um, I would say... Uh, and, and and obviously you had to be a Diamondbacks fan to, to pick them to win the oh, national yeah. pennant. You know nobody saw that coming. Uh, so I would say right now my play would be the San Diego Padres plus fifty five hundred. Oh. And uh, the reason why is that I, I do like their lineup. You know obviously you've got uh, Xander Bogarts and Machado and Fernando Tatis and Cronenworth is they're hurt right now, but he's typically good. Hassan Kim. Uh, and I like their pitching, even though they, they, they lost Blake Snell, 
Uh, they recovered nicely getting uh, uh, Michael King and Dylan Cease. You've got you Darvish and you've got Joe Musgrove. So that's that's a solid foursome. Uh, you know, they, they support that park out there. It's typically a pitcher's park, uh, and uh, they've got a nice home field advantage. So give me the Padres 5,500. Jim? Come on, Jim. <laughs> give me a recommendation. You're my last hope. i got to try to make even some money I'm on baseball. Few, even though I'm not a futures better. Well, tell me. I, who do you think is going to win the World I, Series? I, and don't Andy, say that. Andy and, Andy, Tony, Andy and Tony just pointed out probably the two best bets in, in that respect. I mean, okay. Kansas City, they're, they're obviously live. And San Diego is... You know they don't have a they don't have a history they don't have a history of uh, of, of going far but they, it's a great price and they have built a pretty good team around them so so there's no UConn of uh, baseball this year you like the Cubbies Jim um, why not 25 why not twenty five <laughs> to one yeah twenty five to one is not bad. Uh, Mark? I think another one to consider is uh, is Arizona, which was touched upon. You know, the uh, from champs from last year with Kelly and uh, Zach Gallen, a couple of other guys coming in there, and a team that's just getting better, and a manager who uh, basically saved his job last year, so he's gotten the confidence of the team uh, in him, and we'll see what they do. Now, of course, they're in the division with the Dodgers, but you know, the Dodgers have been dominant in that division. But uh, what do they have that one COVID year uh, World Series to show for? That it? doesn't count. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, are you looking at what three to one now. Yeah, three you to one. You can't play Dodgers. You can't make that bet. No, that's no. ridiculous. Um, Mark, I know you're not going to do anything in, uh, for a little bit, but but just uh, have you – do you think there's more parity right now in baseball than uh, ever before? Because, again, the big teams are not necessarily winning all the time. No, you have your teams like the Yankees who are going to always consistently get money. Uh, the Atlanta Braves, who have been winning with regularity, you know, they're going to be popular at the Dodgers, of course. So the question is, who's going to knock teams off like that? And uh, I think always, every year, there is a team or two that comes up and raises its head and does just that. I can go back to the San Francisco Giants winning the NL West out of nowhere. Uh, was it two, two out of three years when they weren't expected to even be a 500 team? So nothing would surprise me. Major League Baseball that way, but uh, again, until I get into handicapping baseball on a daily basis and form a little bit more of an opinion, I'll sit on the sidelines and be a fan for now. Shouldn't it be Mark, the same? Yeah, Mark, you have to bet on the Guardians. You're from Cleveland. You have to do it. Well, I tell you this, Jim. If they were the Indians, I would bet on them. Okay? All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's your window, Mark. They're off to a great start. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So, it shouldn't isn't baseball? You mentioned San Francisco. I mean, I remember Bochi, what a great manager he was, and and he talked about that with college basketball. Is that isn't that the same thing in baseball? Is that you got to take a look at who are the best managers and say, do they have enough talent? You know, the middling teams, you know, in that in that twenty five to fifty range. And, but they have the best managers, and you know what? Maybe that's a team that could get hot at the right moment with the right manager. Well, what do we make talk, of you're, you're talking. You're, I was gonna say you're talking about managers. Uh, where's Dusty Baker managing these days? He's uh, he was in the booth talking about uh, Hank Aaron the other day, so he's done. Yeah, but I mean, uh, and uh, where did he just have his recent success? Finally, winning one. Houston. Yeah. But no, and, and, uh, and look at Houston this year. But I wouldn't be. I, <laughs> but yeah, Dusty I Baker's understand. not Bruce Bochy. So yeah, but I don't blame Espada for for their issues this year. I mean, their their pitching's off, their hitting's off. You got Abreu's batting like four for forty three, uh, but I, I find it interesting. I, I really didn't know until end of the season that Stephen Boat went from basically playing what one two years ago to being the manager of Cleveland. How'd that happen? And and they keep winning close games and whatever. I mean, it's a lot of luck. I didn't skip, I didn't think much of uh, of. Uh, Skip, what is it, Schumacher in, in, in Miami? Cause it, and, and then they won a ton of one-run games last year. Now, basically, he's saying he wants out of his contract uh, at the end of the season because they, they got off to such a slow start, and Kim Hang went to, to, to New York, and that, that was really who hired him. So I think managing is a crapshoot. It really is a lot of, of luck, and it, it's basically the on-field on thing and staying healthy. You, and, and See, the, I, I'm, I'm in I total up. agreement with Mark in terms of handicapping and, 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 and pitching-wise. That's what dictates Major League Baseball. The reason I brought up the reason I brought up Dusty Baker was, or, or what the guy you brought up, Bruce Bochy. Look what he did: San Diego, San Francisco, goes over to Texas, and what does it take him? Two years. You know, 
know, that 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 type of success is not an accident. That shows. Oh yeah, the, exactly. what a Good manager yeah. he is taking over te a team that had underperformed for so many years, and boom, there they are, there they are, you know, uh, champions. And, uh, and then you take a look at uh, again. I, and I'm not. This is not a criticism of of the Astros now, but sometimes these managers have these intangibles. They know the right decisions. They uh, and it goes back to too many managers are over reliant on analytics. Okay, because it gives them an out. They can defend it because that's what the numbers say. The problem is, and I've, I've, I've talked about it before, analytics is a guide, not a command. You use it to get an understanding. You know, the, uh, I use the other analogy. Yeah, it may be 67% successful, but it's either going to be zero or 100. And when you've, when you've played, or in the case of managers, managed thousands of games, you have a pretty good intuitive idea of what the right decision is, even if the numbers don't back you up because the numbers are based on a wide variety of players of different skills all contributing to those numbers. Hey, guys, i got, I got to turn the lights out on this Major League Baseball party, if we will. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, I was going to suggest, since we're on next week, uh, whether or not we should have uh, an all-NBA show next week instead. I think that would be good. Listen, I have to sign off because I have a previous commitment. But I okay, let's – Oh, no, I like that idea. We'll, we'll, we'll call this our baseball preview show. Okay. And next week we'll come back with our NBA show. Well, we're going to have a lot more to talk about in the NBA because they're going to be playing a little bit. Right. Now, I'm going to give you one play. I like the Denver Nuggets to win it all. Now, I'm not a futures player, but I'm going to bet Denver to win every series, and I'm going to roll it over. I'll get better prices doing it that way than I will betting on the, on the, on the uh, futures market. Now, right now they're three to one. I'm not going to bet that. But next series they're going to play the Lakers. I'm going to bet Denver to win that series, and then the next series I'm going to bet Denver to win their series, and I'll get a better price in this three to one that they're offering at the moment. So you're going I with like uh, to win it all. you're going with college basketball and NBA back to back champs in the same season. Amen. All and, right. It worked. And, hey, it worked in college minute. basketball. You go, the women's and WNBA. Bet the Aces to win it all. Oh, why did they win it last year? That's gonna be that's gonna be last a two years. That's all gonna right. be a three P. That I'll sounds like Las Vegas flavor there, Jim. Las Vegas flavor. They were really good last year. Will they be as good next year? <laughs> they're, they're gonna be good. They're gonna okay. be good. By the, by good the way, coach. with with your Denver play, keep in mind the three to one right now. You may be getting somewhere in the vicinity of even money if it's Denver against Boston. That in itself should guarantee more than a three to one payoff. That's very true. But after you, after you will have already rolled it over a few times, because remember, it takes four series to win the NBA, even if you're laying you know, big prices on those first three. You take, you take $100, put them, on, put them on Denver to beat the Lakers, because that's their first one. And then the second one, and the second, if they keep going, you're going to get a better price than this 3-1. Because they're that. going to be playing better teams that they have to beat along the way, so they won't be laying as much in those future series after the uh, first one. Correct. Well, there have only been six repeat champions, guys, the last 22 years. So Jim Feist, on record, saying it will be seven repeat champions the last 23 years. Oh, hey, they didn't have a one for a long time in college basketball. And that streak ended. Yes, it did. Jim was on, was on New Con there. The Kansas City Chiefs coming for a three-peat in, in football. I mean, this yeah. Is oh, yeah, we're all, we're all hopeful for that. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> one of us is because one of us bet it. Oh, okay. Well, there you right. go. At nine, at nine to one odds when it came out the Sunday night of the Super Bowl. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. I got to run, guys. Thank All righty. Well, Jimmy, you thanks for Jim, thanks. Thanks. this week. And guys, we're going to wrap up the show for this week. I want to thank everybody who joined us for what ended up being our Major League Baseball sort of preview for this 2023 baseball season. Next week, our final show of the season. We'll be back. All of us intact. We'll be reviewing the NBA playoffs. Jim Feist gave you a little bit of a hint of what he'll be looking at, the Denver Nuggets. Andy, Tony, myself, and Greg possibly. Now, I know Greg's not a big NBA guy. We'll also let you know what we're looking at. And until next week, once again, this is Mark Lawrence. Remind you to always remember to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always.